So welcome everyone to our May Zoom talk. Um, this has, as you all know from newsletters, had be a swift change. So I, we were thrilled that Julianne was able to step into the breach. We had approached her last year um, when our program had been collectors and collections, um, but um, we had to cancel that thanks to the first one of the first lockdowns of, of COVID. But fortunately, she was still on hand and able to step into the breach for us. So we're going to proceed in our usual um, Zoom etiquette. We ask participants to remain um, muted through the course of the talk. But if um, questions occur to you um, as it proceeds, then you're welcome to open up that little chat window or box that you can see if you hover your mouse over the bottom, middle bottom of the screen, it usually pops up there and drop in your questions there. And then at the end, um, I can ask on your behalf, um, the end of the talk. The, another lovely thing is that Julie has, Julianne has agreed um, that this be recorded. Um, so in due course, all being well, it will be available um, on our YouTube channel. So it seems even more superfluous than usual to read out what the title is of the talk, but the wonderful thing of course is that it's actually coinciding with the opening, reopening of a related exhibition at the Bodleian. So um, I do hope we're all uh, dutifully rushing. It's a free exhibition, but I'm sure the Bodleian would love it if you bought a souvenir or two and a cup of coffee because we need funds as it were. So it's a wonderful serendipitous tie-in that Julianne, who is the wonderfully named librarian of the John Johnson collection is here to give us a briefing on the wonderful things that she has in store. So I'm just going to retreat as it were and cut off my video and mute myself and hand the floor over to Julianne. Thank you, Julianne. Right. Thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, thank you everyone for coming. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the John Johnson collection, about Johnson as a collector. Um, I'll start with a formal um, talk and then there'll be lots of slides of things in the collection um, with a little commentary. Um, so among its rare books, manuscripts, music scores and maps, the Bodleian houses a large and perhaps unexpected collection of printed ephemera assembled by John de Monins Johnson, 1882 to 1956, papyrologist, printer to the university and ephemerist. In collecting around a million and a half doc printed documents that would normally have been thrown away after use, Johnson's hobby, for such it was, established one of the finest and largest collections of printed ephemera in the world, at a time when such material could be acquired for very little, and when the term ephemera had not been established to give coherence to these heterogeneous items. We are all familiar with ephemera, whether or not we use the term, from election leaflets to takeaway pizza menus, and from bus timetables to clothing catalogues, we are bombarded with paper, electronic age or not. Not all ephemera are junk mail, not all are free. Theatre programmes, tickets, in paper form at least, Christmas and birthday cards are ephemera. We won't open a debate on whether collectibles, such as cigarette cards and souvenirs, are properly ephemera, or indeed if we now include born electronic ephemera, or we'll be here all night. Sharing its route for the Mayfly, the use of the term ephemera to donate paper items intended to be of limited duration is relatively recent. Although Johnson used the terms printed ephemera, the ephemera of printing and ephemeral printing, the term printed ephemera was really established in 1962 by John Lewis's book of that title, which drew heavily on Johnson's collection as well as his own. People often find the word off-putting, which is a pity as the material itself is so accessible. Is it singular or plural? Plural. Should it be pronounced ephemera or ephemera? Properly the latter, but ephemeris almost always say ephemera. It is nonetheless a very useful umbrella term for lots of miscellaneous documents lying in odd corners of libraries and museums, and for collections of such material, from exquisite 18th century trade cards, such as these, to air sickness bags, those being collected before use in my house. Here is the lovely Benjamin Burks of Worcester card in close-up, a real treasure, engraved by the London engraver Benjamin Cole and showing the process of making tobacco and snuff. 
Johnson himself struggled slightly to define his collection to others, and as has so often been the case since, described ephemera in negative terms. It is difficult to describe it, except by saying that it is everything that would ordinarily go into the waste paper basket after use, everything printed which is not actually a book. Another way of describing it is to say that we gather everything which a museum or library would not ordinarily accept if it were offered as a gift, so that these university collections fill a gap in the world which nothing else really fills. Collected on this wide area, they render us open to the banter of the world. It's time to introduce you to John Johnson, whose path to collecting ephemera was shaped by chance. An Oxford education, political changes in Egypt, excavations in Antinui, and the uh, outbreak of war in 1914, all led, improbably, to the formation of a little museum of common printed things at Oxford University Press. Although he was born in Lincolnshire, Johnson was very much an Oxford man. He was educated at Magdalen College School, then Exeter College, where he read greats and then studied Arabic for a further year. His initial career in the Egyptian civil service from 1905 to 7 was short-lived due to political changes. But Johnson then became a papyrologist of excavating in Antinui, now Sheikh Abada, and writing up in Oxford. His discovery of the Theoc Theocritus Papyrus 900 years earlier than any previously known manuscript of the author would have ensured a starred career in papyrology, but the outbreak of the First World War led to an unplanned change of direction. Unfit for military service, Johnson returned to Oxford and was employed by OUP as Assistant Secretary to the Delegates of the Press. He married his boss's daughter, Dorothea Cannon, with whom he had two children. The family lived in a house, then called Bear Acres, shown here, in Barton Lane, Headington. Although he did eventually write up that for the Theocritus Papyrus, Johnson became printed to the university in 1925 and remained at the press thereafter, modernising it, keeping it running through World War II and seeing the Oxford English Dictionary through to completion, for which he received an honorary doctorate in 1928. Although he retired in 1946, Johnson continued to work on his collection at the press until his death in 1956. The seeds of the collection were sown in Antinui, where Johnson asked himself what we were doing to preserve our immediate paper heritage. He wrote, often I used to look over those dark and crumbling sites and wonder what could be done to treat the background of our own English civilization with the same minute care with which we scholars were treating the ancient. The press proved the ideal environment in which to form the collection. In the 1930s, the University Press provided Johnson with the former Bible printer's office to house the collection, which had outgrown its initial shoeboxes under beds in his house. He named it the Constance Mead Memorial Collection of Ephemeral Printing, in homage to the benefactress who had enabled him to furnish his cabins, as he called them, with such taste. So here are four slides of those cabins. The press also furnished offcuts of paper for mounts, and its apprentices bound Johnson's file boxes and tooled leather labels denoting the subject sections of the collection. Through his profession, Johnson formed a network of conoscenti who would find sources of ephemera for him. Booksellers of his acquaintance would send bundles of printed documents, most of which had no market value at the time. When Johnson died in 1956, there were about a million and a half items housed in thousands of folders and boxes with a thousand subject sections. Chronologically, the ephemera ranged from 1508, two fragments of a printed indulgence, to 1939, which Johnson established as his cutoff date. The strengths of the original collection are its 18th and 19th century material. It is almost exclusively British. The aim of the collection was to document both social and printing history, and there was a more concrete aim too, the publication of an encyclopedia illustrated by these primary documents, a new idea at the time. The Oxford Junior Encyclopedia in 12 volumes was published in 1948. Crucially, the collection became the property of the university. Johnson was a pioneer in collecting printed ephemera on this scale. Others, such as John Selden and Samuel Pepys, Sarah Banks and Gabriel Enthoven had confined themselves to street ballads, trade cards or playbills. Johnson collected them all. He challenged people to suggest any area which was not represented in his collection. 
He was very conscious of creating something new in his stock letter to people who expressed an interest in his collection. He wrote, for some 15 or whatever years past, I have given the little leisure which a busy life of manufacture allows me to the creation of a museum of a new kind, which in its own small way is beginning, and in future I hope will be more and more, a department of the university. Nowadays, if people ask me what is the purpose of these collections, I always say that it is to give a new history of the English people, as seen in the printed ephemera of the day-to-day -day lives of its men and women. It is a simple and intelligible purpose, and luckily, it has the limitations of the scarcity of the material. It all started as something less ambitious and grew as most English things grow. I had conceived the idea of starting a little museum of common printed things to illustrate at one and the same time the historical development of our social life and the development of printing. It was to be the museum of what is commonly thrown away or is too often thrown away, or the ordinary printed paraphernalia of our day-to-day -day lives in size from the large broadside to the humble calling card and varying in splendor from the magnificent invitations to coronations of kings to the humblest piece of street literature sold for a penny or less. He was also well aware that the success of his collection lay in its organization. In a letter to Strickland Gibson, keeper of the archives, in 1945, he wrote, some years ago, a director of the Huntington Museum of California came to Europe to see what Europe was doing on this side of things. He went to Germany and drew blank. He went to London and drew blank. But in London, someone happened to mention Oxford and my name, and he came here and settled down to study what we were trying to do. At the end, he gave it as his opinion that the principal reason why we appeared to have some prospect of success was that we had broken clean away from all library technique, which could not be adapted to such a purpose as this. In his opinion, only those standing outside library technique and viewing the problem from a detached and experimental point of view had a chance of success. For instance, a library's card index of such a collection would be as big as the collection itself. The colours of the findings I referred to were not purely ornamental, but the key to Johnson's main headings or themes. If I show you a later colour slide of the collection at the new library before its transformation into the Western Library, you will get a sense of this. The boxes have been repaired since this image was taken. On the left, you see blue for theatre, green for political, religious, social and economic history, and yellow ochre for advertising. On the right, there are red boxes, tickets and menus, ephemera kept by their genre, light blue for prints, flanked by green boxes containing other ephemera by genre, such as Valentine's, Christmas cards, greeting booklets, and so on. And through the arch, you can see Johnson's original chair and the blue private press boxes. In the new library, uh, where the collection was from 1968 to 2010, the collection was housed at street level, overlooking the King's Arms end of modern. These rooms are now the staff reader cafe. My desk, which you can just see to the right of Johnson's original chair, is now a coffee machine. The collection was transferred to the book storage facility in Swindon during the transformation of the new library into the Western Library and is now back on site, but more securely stored in an environmentally controlled rolling stack where the boxes can be, still be navigated by colour. The main themes of the collection are listed here. There is no one way to sort the ephemera. Johnson and his assistant, Lillian Thrussell, nay Gurdon, did whatever was appropriate. Advertisements are arranged by product, playbills and programmes by venue and then chronologically, trade cards by trade and then place, and so on. The material was mounted onto thin card, often singly, but sometimes in attractive arrangements, as here, which protected the individual items from handling. By storing these mounts in boxes, the ephemera were also protected from light damage, hence the vivid colours. Finding aids were necessarily simple, a guide to what was in each box and its arrangement. The contents of the boxes were in the heads of Johnson and Lil, Johnson's long-term assistant. Of Lil, Johnson wrote, what the world is called the sanctuary of printing owes its origin to a number of things, Perhaps it is a child of the rubbish mounds in Egypt. Perhaps it is in part a child of my own inveterate love of collecting for others. It is even more the child of the qualities of good memory and mindfulness, technical inventiveness in dealing with material and incomparable diligence of Miss L.R. Gurdon, who has given all the leisure of the last 12 years of her life unpaid to the formation of it. And it was to Lil, her nickname, 
that the University Press appeared, appealed when John, John Johnson died suddenly in 1956, following surgery. Between Johnson's death and the transfer of the collection to the Bodleian 12 years later, Lil took care of the collection on a daily basis under the management of Harry Carter. It was Lil, too, who accompanied the collection to the Bodleian in 1968. Under the direction of Michael Turner, the first curator of the collection, she continued to work on the collection she loved so much until the day when, perhaps disappointed to no longer have the autonomy she had enjoyed for many years, perhaps sensing that her work was done and well done, she left. They still have the glasses and shoes she left behind. I was privileged to meet Lil on several occasions when she would, of course, reminisce, and I attended her funeral in, in 2005. A hallmark of Johnson's collection is that he was convinced that ephemera should survive by chance and not design. In his letter to Strickland Gibson in 1945 about the aims and future of the collection, he wrote, I am satisfied that what I may call contemporary collecting is out of the question. Wartime ARP, air raid precaution, ephemera alone, would fill room space many times the whole existing space of the sanctuary. Thus, we have made the outbreak of war the main terminus antiquum. I hope that the future may be tempted to add out of the unconscious selection of the present, just as we in the present have ad added out of the unconscious selection of the past. This unconscious selection must always be the foundation of any collection, which is most manageable and typical. If Johnson had the discipline not to preserve anything from the Second World War, there were nevertheless exceptions, including ad advertisements that represent evolving technologies, such as wireless television and gramophones, or the prestigious output of private presses, many of whose printers he knew. Johnson found his ephemera mainly by word of mouth, in the basements and attics of private houses, in the old stock of shops, such as the Civet Cat in Tewkesbury, as well as from booksellers. The provenance of individual items of ephemera is almost never documented. Where that the market would catch up with ephemera, as indeed it has, he collected discreetly. There was one article by Holbrook Jackson, Jackson about the collection in the typographical journal Signature in November uh, 1935, and the privately printed Desiderata for the Sanctuary Printing, as Johnson's collection was called by his circle Conoscenti in 1937. Johnson also incorporated entire collections, such as the Horn Collection of Cigarette Cards, Bellamy Collection of Postal History, and the Eve Maud Hater Collection of Valentine Cards. In such cases, he usually preserved the name of the original collector on special plaques, as here. He also collected artefacts, usually, but not always, incorporating printed labels. It is not for nothing that he referred to his collection as a museum, it's very much a hybrid. And I should add that Johnson also collected maps, book, music and books, all of which were transferred to the Bodleian in 1968, filling many gaps in the library's holdings. Johnson's relationship with the Bodleian was complex. From 1938, the library provided him, through Strickland Gibson, with many ephemera, considered insufficiently serious to be retained. A new clause of the library's statute in 1938 enabled the elimination of material of no literary or artistic value <clears throat> or of an ephemeral nature, which it is not in the interest of the library to include in the general catalogue or preserve on the shelves. Although of material benefit, this attitude towards the very material that he was collecting must have been difficult for Johnson, who had dreamt that his collection would one day become a small typographical wing of the Bodleian. But it was a mere 30 years later that these items came back into the library with the collection, renamed the John Johnson Collection of Printed Ephemera, an astonishing fault fast. By 1971, the library was presenting ephemera to a bemused public in a major exhibition that showcased the scope, importance, and scholarly interest of fiction. The exhibition catalogue is online, although without images as yet, and the introduction by Michael Turner, the first curator of the collection shown here on the left with Bodley's librarian, uh, Robert Shackleton, remains the best introduction to the formation of the collection. The exhibition was groundbreaking, even as some of the reviews couldn't resist references to litter. Before looking in more detail at some of the material in the collection, let us pause to consider John Johnson as a person. Undoubtedly, he was considered an eccentric, not least because of the collection, but people who knew him, many of whom died, have suggested to me that he was quite severe, but also 
kind. He was immensely hardworking. During the Second World War, he cut the university presses running for war work, was responsible for the safety of the surrounding area and slept at the press. His leisure was to get up at 4 a.m. to work on his collection, something I bear in mind. Although married with two children, he was not a family man. My favorite quotation, and it's a long one, I'm afraid, because it reveals so much about Johnson, albeit in his retirement, in the context of his collection, is the introduction to Gillian Avery's book of The Strange and Odd, a children's book based entirely on items in the collection. Having had the privilege of knowing the collection, both at the press and at the Bodleian, she writes, when I first met the collection in the 1950s, it was housed in the University Press where I was then working and its founder, John Johnson, formerly printed to the university, presided over it, autocratic, aquiline, an object of awe. When one went there to find material to illustrate an educational book, Dr. Johnson, he had received an honorary doctorate from the university and unlike most honorary doctors like to be known by the title, would be found perched high on a high stool contemplating his treasures. The two rooms which housed the collection were a curious combination of order and apparent chaos. The walls were lined from floor to ceiling with box files and portfolios. There were more of them in the counters that filled the middle of the rooms. Most of the items in the collection had been beautifully mounted, carefully labelled and put away in these, and Dr Johnson had these, their contents at his fingertips. Did I want a picture of a 19th century kitchen? He would find it on an advertisement for grape polish in the box labelled paints and oils. An item about a highwayman. A broadside illustrating Dick Turpin was in murders and executions. But there was a wilderness of objects, tossed in careless profusion on every available surface. Old Valentines and Christmas cards, catalogues, children's cutouts and toys. There was no hoping that I could finger these fascinating piles. Dr Johnson would direct my attention to the Chartist Manifesto I'd asked him for, tell me that he would have it photographed, and I was dismissed. The diversity of, his, of his, his collection and its creator's knowledge was staggering. Most collectors follow one line. It may be postage stamps or matchbox tops or tram tickets, 17th century engravings, children's books or the products of private printing presses. Grandly, Dr. Johnson included them all. After his death, the collection was moved to the Bodleian. Dr. Johnson's presence still seems to brood over it. There are drawings of him. The JJ monogram that Eric Gill designed is still very much in evidence. Some of the toys, the Magic Lantern, for instance, and the Puffing Billy toy engine still lie about, but now the reader can himself search through the boxes that in the old days only the founder's hand could open. In our own age, we have of course gone far, far beyond access to individual readers and the library. The digital age has enabled us to make major parts of the collection available worldwide. We can now look at ephemera in new ways, in virtual arrangements facilitated by detailed metadata, sometimes enhanced by optical character recognition. It is worth pausing to reflect on the differences between ephemera books and manuscripts. Although not always single sheet, ephemera tend to be slight and so can be taken in at a glance, making them ideal candidates for digitization and for exhibitions, of which more later. Unlike manuscripts, they were published, Unlike books, maps and music, they were not intended to survive their immediate purpose. And most ephemera only exist because there was a compelling purpose, a need for communication. They speak to us through the centuries with an immediacy, sometimes even urgency, that makes it both easy to relate to them, but also easy to spot differences in perception and changes in habits. Many ephemera were designed to attract attention through text and image, and this led directly to many advances in printing, such as large display and ornamental typefaces, and developments in chromolithography, enabling the commercially viable printing of large-scale illustrated posters in colour. Ephemera are often illustrated, and digital pro projects have tended, of course, to focus on ephemera of graphic interest, to the detriment of textual documents. In the library context, these attributes have long stood in the way of cataloguing ephemera, even when the technology was available to do so. What ephemera lack are the elements that are fundamental to book cataloguing, titles, authors, dates and imprints. They may have some of these, they may have none. The frequent lack of dates, and you only have to look at advertisements, leaflets and posters of our own time to see that the problem hasn't gone away, is, is particularly frustrating. 
Dating ephemera is an enjoyable exercise in itself, but the lack of a printed date means, for example, that the Oxford English Dictionary cannot really use ephemera as much as would be desirable in tracing early uses of words. It also means that we often find ourselves describing items of ephemera as redolent of their time, without really being able to pinpoint that time precisely. What ephemera do contain is a wealth of information, names, addresses, trades, subjects, and it is these that we try to capture in our detailed cataloguing. Again, just as in arranging the material, it helps to stand outside of library technique. In fact, cataloguing coupled with digitization helps researchers to be able to rearrange the collection virtually according to their own interests. Ephemera are, of course, only pieces of the jigsaw of history. But their contribution is unique. I can't resist adding here this 17th century quotation from John Selden's Table Talk, published posthumously in 1869, uh, 18, sorry, 1689, which sums up the essence of ephemera. Selden himself collected ballads. Though some make slight of libels, yet you will that yet you may see by them how the wind sits, as take a straw and throw it up into the air. You shall see by that which way the wind is, which you shall not do by casting up a stone. More solid things do not show the complexion of the time so well as ballads and libels. Ephemera are used as evidential data in many areas of research, social history, printing history, design history, local history, family history, etymology, material culture and ephemera studies among them. There is a centre for ephemera studies at the University of Reading. In my 34 years in the collection, I've rarely had the same inquiry twice. Honester of ephemera and so much else, Rena Warner, a valued friend of the collection, writes in these terms. The John Johnson collection hands over to each of us a metal detector as it were, and a specially gifted quasi-magical one, which unfailingly discovers a rich and revealing recounting of the past in words of every kind, documents as casual as breathing. The odd bits and pieces of paper, card and printed matter that punctuate the course of an ordinary day, almost visibly, a bus ticket, a lottery receipt, a circular or flyer thrust, thrust into your hand in the street, the cafe paper napkin, the baker's wrapping paper, can become saturated with meaning, however paltry they seem at first. The point of ephemera is to reveal the ordinary texture of existence, not its exceptional moments. For many years, during reading and researching towards several books and exhibitions, I've explored the collections, aiming to deepen my sense of the ways people thought about ogres or fairies or witches, for example. Handbills and programmes, toys and board games often show how such figures were represented and do so in an unguarded way, which reveals more than a careful treatise on the topic. Materials of the ephemeral kind become paradoxically weighty witnesses. They let you eavesdrop on the vernacular of the past. So let's do just that. I've put together some slides that show you something of the scope of the collection. And although I have assigned subjects to them, I hope that you will bear in mind as we go through how many other applications these images could have. Many different online searches will bring up these same images. Maximising the potential of the ephemera in the John Johnson collection for me is the real joy of the electronic age. In brackets are, referenced, are references to the online resource where you can find these particular images. Most, but not by no means all, are from our major ProQuest project. I will post a screen of URLs at the end, but all are linked from the project pages of our website. I'll begin by looking in a little depth at just one example. This attractive advertisement for Stoa's lime juice cordial is clearly of interest to historians of women's dress or of bicycles. A bicycle was, after all, a powerful symbol of increasing freedom of movement for women, as was the slightly raised hemline here. This advertisement is typical of the 1880s and 1890s, where a chromolithograph image, often reduced from a poster, with Minimal text was designed to attract attention, while the versa gave detailed information. Here, this includes directions for use, a chemical analysis, and of course, claims of the health giving properties and superiority of the product. These are backed up by testimonials and quotations from medical journals, harking back to earlier text heavy advertising. This is also an example of the sort of advertisement I find really interesting. 
it reveals several problems which the product claims to solve. We read that the musty taste and smell, which predominate in most, if not all, other cordials, is entirely absent. The analysis states that it is also completely free from tartaric, hydrochloric or sulfuric acids and mineral contaminations derived from vessels or tanks. Lead and other poisonous ingredients are entirely absent in the glass of the bottles, an exceeding, exceedingly important consideration. The drink is marketed as pure and non-alcoholic, presumably in an attempt to attract teetotalers, although as one of the recipes on the verse is for claret cup, it is not being marketed strictly as a temperance drink. Antiscorbutic and anti-rheumatic, as well as being the only healthy beverage that can be safely taken after cycling or other exercise. Quite a claim. Note to the trademark and the warning, every bottle should bear this trademark. The first trademarks were introduced in the UK in 1876 after the passing of the British Trademarks Registration Act the previous year. They were widely used in the hope of combating counterfeits. Versos of advertisements such as this are fascinating, but are very rarely reproduced, even in more academic works. The front is so much more visually compelling, but only tell part of the story. Here, the attractive artwork is anonymous, as was so often the case. And it is only through the testimonials that we can date the advertisement to 1895 and slightly later. The latest reference is to the British Medical Journal in that year, 1895. So on with a much more whistle-stop tour of some of the million and a half items collected by John Johnson. As you might expect, the collection is rich in items relating to the book trade. Here we see trade cards for a bookseller and stationer and for a binder, as well as a circulating library label and a booksellers label. Booksellers sold far more than just books, especially in the provinces, and often undertook printing and binding, as here. This tradesman's list for farmer's bookseller Matthew Allison pays scant attention to books, just referring to Bibles, common prayers, books in all languages, but lists in some details types of stationery, musical instruments, glassware, mathematical instruments and medicines, adding that he sen sells garden seeds from London. Apart from glass and seeds, perhaps, all were commonly sold by book booksellers. The annotation in pencil at the top tells us that this example was bound into a book dated 1750. This too was common practice. Yellow backs were reprints of popular and classic novels often sold at railway stations. These are proofs of the covers printed by Edmund Evans. We've got quite a nice collection of these. One of our most prestigious prospectuses for the Shakespeare and Company's unabridged edition of Joyce, Joyce's Ulysses. There are many publishers lists in the John Johnson collection and also in the main holdings of the Bodleian. Here we have a reminder that many novels were published in parts or serialised in magazines as here, with each instalment typically ending with a cliffhanger. The famous yellow book um, poster here is, is um, illustrated by Aubrey Beardsley. Um, and the list of contributors includes many of the famous, most famous authors of the late 19th century. Much lighter in tone on the right is the first page of a full page prospectus for the Ladies Magazine of Fiction and Fashion. It is headed with, if you are so unfortunate as to be a man, will you please pass this on to a lady? Tradesman's lists are some of my favourite items in the collection as they show the range of goods for sale in specific types of shop, including many items still considered exotic today. Those researching products such as furniture, grates and tools will find much of interest in the collection. These are beautifully engraved, but a bonus is the addition of Undertaker um, in the William Castle trade card. Many tradesmen were also Undertakers. Cabinet making, cabinet making is, of course, an obvious connection. The trade card for William Boyce, Undertaker, with its appropriate iconography re representing his trade sign, is our earliest illustrated trade card. Several trade cards and prints provide welcome records of tradesmen and manufacturers actually at work. 
fascinating two representations of window displays in the 18th and early 19th centuries, including Gilray's print, Very Slippy Weather, indeed, showing Hannah Humphrey's print shop in 1808, with the prints turned towards the street for the benefit of passers-by. Fascinating, too, are representations of window displays. Oh, sorry. Um, advertisements that prey on fear reveal the preoccupations of their age. Here, fear of noxious fumes and of death itself. The latter is si simply averted by the use of Blackham's, Blackham's vegetable tonic. We think of free from as a modern concept, but here, matchless metal polish is free from acid. This advertisement is interesting in its photomechanical depictions of Queen Victoria and her successors, and the successors to her matchless reign, and also for the instruction to be loyal, don't purchase foreign polish polishes. Pears marketed their soap on its purity, but allude here to poisons in other soaps. Dudley Hardy's Yellow Girl poster for Today magazine launched commercial art in this country decades after Chevet in Paris. Here we have a Dudley Hardy advertisement showing a cookery assistant. These coquettish women travelled the country assisting chefs to market stoves, a popular entertainment at the time. The French poster for Ink is by Eugène Grasset. Fine art is represented in the collection by exhibition handbills and catalogues, but also by a lovely collection of private view cards. Design history is, of course, everywhere, even in the ornamental arrangements of the tools and products we saw earlier. These examples are from the 1920s and 30s. We have a wealth of entertainment ephemera relating to plays, concerts, performing animals, magic, circuses, panoramas, cinema, and so on. Playbills and programmes are great resources too for family of historians. David the sapient pig is one of our favourite items in the collection. Uh, he could do so much, it appears. The ease with which we can now find dramatization of, dramatizations of novels always makes me remember a professor who came to Oxford in the 1980s to research dramatizations of Dickens and Scott. He had to go through every single box. And here we have a dramatization of Alice in Wonderland for Oxford interest. Posters for more popular entertainment showing the variety of typography and limited use of coloured inks that help to highlight the important parts of the dense text, a type of reading referred to as street reading. Very relevant to these forlorn times are the attempts of our predecessors to engage the public in virtual travel through models and static and moving panoramas. Panoramas also brought war into the realm of entertainment. Sorry, I've gone slightly ahead of myself there. There are some more panoramas, mirroramas. And here we move on to war, um, including in Oxford Town Hall. Joseph Poole's mirroramas, as he called them, were very popular. Everything new, bright, sparkling, and up to date. For the charge of the Light Brigade at the Royal London Panorama Square, we have handbills and the accompanying booklet with its impressive reproduction of the painting. Noteworthy here, too, are the references to ele electricity. Here. And it's folding up, uh, it's fold out um, of the artwork. As I said earlier, a camera could be used much more to trace the use of words if they were dated. This handbill shows the original Pantechnicon building with the OED references. 
You will have realized by now that I love to juxtapose ephemera. These two illustrations are just 12 years apart. The chilling trench coat name, Son, says it all. The John Johnson collection differs from many collections in London institutions in the importance and quality and quantity of its provincial ephemera. Here we have some Oxford examples that were assembled into an Oxford trade section, which didn't actually exist um, in Johnson's time, by Michael Turner for the book he wrote with David Vasey on Oxford shops and shopping. These and 207 more substantial Oxford trade pamphlets mainly catalogues, um, can be searched and browsed through our ProQuest project. Johnson, as I said, assembled his collection to document both social and printing history. Of course, virtually everything is printed. But we have stunning examples of specific printing processes, from the hand-cut wood type of this lottery's poster to the exquisite engraving of Magnolia and Christopher Gray's a catalogue of the of American trees and shrubs that will endure the climate of England. And chrome lithography, such as the label for the Royal Jubilee stationery covenant here. In this slide, we have a label printed on silk, which was dropped by George III when he was shot at from the stalls at Drury Lane Theatre in 1800. Um, there's a letter attached to this item on, on the mount um, documenting this, and as you can see at the bottom, um, there's a manuscript um, annotation. Um, the other examples are of com Congrave compound plate security printing, with the white lines running through the text and image, um, and there's um, lovely embossing too. And an example of rainbow printing, which was achieved by inking the roller with different colours. The collection also contains various categories of prints, mostly popular and satirical. There is also a good quantity of women's suffrage ephemera, supplemented by a recently acquired large collection of propaganda postcards, the John Fraser collection. You may have seen some of these in the Bodleian exhibition, Suffer to Su Suffrage Women Who Dared. There are many representations of class, although advertisements rarely show the poor other than the servants. And I love this sense of entitlement. Um, the little girl who says, Grandmama, Grandma with candles was lighted to bed. Mama said that she used gaslight instead. I have BTH Edison electric light switched on and off by nurse every night. So racing through examples of social history, um, here we have ephemera relating to emigration, um, to the gold diggings, the ladies' outfit to Australia, and uh, the Allen line for emigrants to Canada and the United States. We also have crime with its graphic representations of murders, um, and uh, wood blocks showing hangings, and if they didn't have quite um, enough in the standard wood block they had to hand, then they could just add some people in the margin, in the stuff. And in an exception to depictions of the poor and advertising, the F. Allen and Son advertisement here implies that a family could easily emerge from poverty if the husband gave up drinking um, and the family were to enjoy chocolates instead. We have a large section of temperance ephemera, much of it documenting the involvement of the artist George Cruikshank. And of course, real rather than virtual travel is well documented too. I will end this section with just a few examples of lesser known genres of ephemera. Bellman's verses were distributed by town criers and lamplighters at Christmas in the hope of a tip. These are some of the artifacts in the collection relating to the Great Exhibition. Um, the item to the right is a rose souvenir, 
Um, these steel engraved folded souvenirs were printed in Germany, but we have many for towns in England. I think we have Cambridge, but sadly not Oxford yet. Johnson's collection contains many boards and educational games, which you can enjoy through digital bobbing. We have also recently inquired about um, 1,600 games from Richard Ballam. These complement the children's books in the OP collection, making the Bovian something of a mecca for those researching childhood. When the Thames froze over, printing booths were taken onto the river and keepsakes were printed, such as these cross, cross um, papers. Of course, the uh, border and the uh, example on the right would have been pre-printed. Pre School pieces are a genre we are avidly collecting. These borders were produced in black and white or hand colours for children to fill in with their best handwriting, usually at Christmas, and little vignettes um, taken from the um, example from the Harding collection on the left um, shows that taking place. Um, one of our visiting scholars, Jill Sheffron, is actually trying to um, compile um, a complete catalogue of all known um, British examples. So if you know any, that are lurking anywhere, um, please let us know. So I've spoken a lot about the ProQuest collection. This covers just five areas of the John Johnson collection. Um, advertising, 19th century entertainment, the 18th century is on the digital bodleian, crime, murders and executions, book trade, although not all, and popular prints. It's free to all in the UK, so I do hope that you will explore it. There are two ways of accessing it, either through the location URL, um, which is a direct way in, or through the homepage, um, and at the bottom there you can have free national access, access this collection, just click on that. You can browse and search, including tailored searches for each of the five sections. So for example, you can find out um, which people were transported for cheap stealing um, in the crime um, search screen. Um, here I've done a quick search for um, Ifley, and this brought up some unexpected results. I really wasn't try, um, expecting to find very much at all, um, mainly through the full text searching enabled by optical character recognition software, um, which of course only works for letterpress text. Um, it, it does, however, provide a whole level, new level of access to the material. So here there is an entry um, in a Randolph Hotel brochure, a testimonial by an Ifley resident for the Steam Laundry Company in Littlemore, and an entry for John Undershell as a member of the special jury for the, summer, the Oxford Summer Sizes of 1854. The most interesting how, find, however, is a reference to Ifley in a rather racy play first performed on August 1st, 1869, Drury Lane. Formosa or the Railroad to Ruin, which featured the Oxford Boat Race on stage. Apparently the play was once notorious as the first English courtesan play of the 19th century. It is rare that the John Johnson collection does not feature in bodily and exhibitions. I'm often asked to visual material. Since the, 19th, the 1971 exhibition, there have been three major John Johnson collection exhibitions, The Nature of Shopkeepers in 2001, Children's Games and Pastimes in 2006, um, and also um, Clive Hurst Dickens' um, exhibition uh, drew heavily on the collection. Um, but currently we have my ill favoured The Art of Advertising, which opened just before the first lockdown in March and has rarely been opened since. Good news is that it reopened yesterday. Please do go and see it if you can. Um, more than you can, um, and uh, otherwise you could explore it online, but it's by no means as good online. Um, it, um, as the title suggests, um, looks at the art, artwork of advertising, but really um, more, much, is much more about the um, social history um, side of advertising. There are also two books, one fairly scholarly and co-authored, um, the other essentially a picture book. You can follow us on Twitter. And lastly, here are the URLs I promised you, which I think you, um, since this is recorded, I think you'll be able to get after, after the talk and my contacts.
please bear in mind that only a small proportion of the collection is online. So please, if you have an inquiry that falls outside the scope of our digital resources, do get in touch. Thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you so much indeed, Julie. That was fascinating as I knew it would be. I've been peering intently at my screen and so grateful that you did agree for it to be recorded so that we can watch it at a leisure later as well as go to the exhibition in due course. I don't know whether you can see it, but I have got my my copy just the other day. Um, to start like reading. To... <laughs> <laughs> so we like have it. got, crucially in the chat, question um how long is it going to be running for all things being well social distancing wise all things being equal um it's open until the end of august so august the 30th the bank holiday monday will be its last day and do we book um are we booking online for i mean i know it's free but do we have to book to make sure we have a space place as it were or not currently, um, no. Um, I'm, I haven't been in since it opened, so I'm not sure whether they are restricting numbers, but I imagine so. But to be perfectly honest, when it was open um, between the last two lockdowns, um, it was not well attended. People just aren't travelling. We don't have the tourist um, footfall that we used to have in Oxford, that we're used to in Oxford. Um, so I would think that you stand a pretty good chance of... Um, being able to get in, not least because um, Roots and uh, Shoots, no, Roots and something, um, the botanical, wonderful botanical um, exhibition open today. So um, in the STV gallery, so there are two um, exhibitions buying for the, such visitor numbers as, as we have. Oh, it's a lovely thought of freedom that we don't have to think of pre-booking in advance for things. It's, it's not Tolkien. <laughs> <laughs> Tolkien you did have to. Right, so I'll just see if there, there might be another question or two. Uh, yes, are you still actively adding to the collection? Yes, we are. And I, I deliberately didn't go into what we're currently doing, hoping that somebody might ask the question um, because I, I just thought I had just too much material. Um, we are adding to the collection retrospectively, as Dodson hoped we would, and also, as he hoped we wouldn't, um, contemporaneously. So we can't afford any longer to have this retrospective um, approach to ephemera, um, even things from the 80s, you know, sell for um, 50p a pound, whatever. I mean, to build up a collection, um, it would uh, be, be very expensive. So we, we get the ephemeral while it's free. Um, we do, uh, as Johnson did, um, collect across the board and uh, we sort it into not such fine categories. We haven't got a thousand um, open categories, but we, have, uh, we do sort the material into um, categories um, when it comes in and we much prefer things that come in immediately um, um, people offering us you know material from the 70s and 80s yes we do accept it but it's very difficult to integrate it meaningfully maybe my successors will be able to do that um, when the material becomes uh, of more interest um, so we make special um, collecting um, uh, efforts at election time. Obviously, we're collecting COVID ephemera, um, sadly, and uh, anything to do with royalty. Um, Brexit, of course, from both sides. Um, so major things like that. But otherwise, yes, your pizza leaflets and all sorts of things. Um, but we would be very grateful for um, contributions to, um, to COVID, particularly. Um, ephemera, just references to masks and all sorts of things in catalogs. And so or um, any reference to changes of dates or uh, well, you know, sort of thing. Um, so yes, we do. And we do buy um, old ephemera and we, as, as I um, implied, um, accept whole collections as Johnson did. So the collection is very much growing. So you, it, you haven't, well, there's um, the, the question I carried on um, about whether you were relieved that so much ephemera is now available on platforms like mobile phones and things like that, but um, you're still keen to get what you can from this period. 
Yes, we are not equipped to deal with electronic ephemera at all. Um, and one area in which that is a problem is on the uh, Oxford University societies, because we used to, before COVID, um, go to Freshers Fair once a year and pick up everything that um, they were giving out to students. So term cards um, and uh, little posters, even slips of paper, just to document Oxford University societies. Um, which is a heavily used section, but of course, um, most of that is now electronic. People don't produce term cards the way they used to. Um, so it's problematic in that area. But really, I haven't noticed that the volume of paper ephemera has decreased. I mean, uh, it's paralleled perhaps by uh, catalogues or whatever on your mobile phone, but at the moment, people seem to have an appetite for paper still. I think the other ones are just um, thanks for a fascinating talk and promises undertakings to either watch it again or and or both go to the exhibition as well. Thanks. So um, you've clearly really good. been a big hit here. Um, has, thanks, if anybody's got a question they um, at this stage, they could unmute and ask directly if there's anybody there who'd like to pose a question. Yeah, Elizabeth, it's Marianne. Yes, please. Uh, hi. Um, it's just slightly sort of um, left field, but uh, um, my original alma mater was the University of Cape Town, which has just had a huge fire in its library. Mm -hmm. And I uh, gather that a lot of ephemera um, posters, uh, uh, newspapers about the anti-apartheid struggle and so on have been destroyed permanently and I just wondered what is you know this stuff is obviously very fragile and you know destroyable um is is most of it recorded online now in the John Johnson collection mm. um well no I mean it's a it's a very small proportion really um that, that is um that is online, and um, but some of the most Im important things. But um, uh, but I mean, yes, it's a it's a it's a very good reason for digitization. Um, um, as I mm. said, the more textual ephemera um, tend not to have attracted funding for digitization, um, and that would include a lot of political um, process material, mm. um, and a lot is also in copyright. So uh, at one point we were going to do a, um, a South African war um, project uh, with one of the major um, um, producers of electronic um, resources and uh, so much of that was in copyright as indeed women's suffrage and first world war material is. Oh really? Um, Still? Um, well it's 70 years from the death of the creator um, so the either the author or the artist um, and so we and then we and, and I'm talking 10 or 15 20 years ago so mm. uh, but even even now I'm there still you know, copyright problems with some of this material um so you can't really just i mean you can you can have a file copy of uh, in the library you know, just for, on, on one terminal but i mean you know you're not going to be able to do that um economically so uh no i mean it's it is vulnerable, vulnerable material of mm. um yeah no, that's, i'm very very sorry to hear that because, um, yes no it was terrible mm important uh, library and an important collection. Okay, thanks, thanks for your talk, In interesting. I'll, I'll mute now. Thanks. Well, I think that's possibly the end of the questions. No, I am so relieved that a 4 a.m. start is not written into your contractors <laughs> following in John Johnson's footsteps, that would be over wow. and above the call of duty. Well, and there that's was the sheer amount of correspondence that he um, that he generated to do with the, the collection. I mean, considering it was his hobby, I mean, it's it's quite staggering what he achieved. Um, you know, in conjunction with being full time printer at the university. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. Very humbling. <laughs> yeah, very very humbling. <laughs> Can't even keep my own house collection books and orders. <laughs> Less said about that, the better. Well, thank you very much, Julie. Um, well, I'm sure thank you for I speak from all, for all of us. It was fascinating, and we look forward to seeing more, both online and um, the.
those of us who can make it into um, Broad Street will be hot footing it, I'm sure, making yes. sure we grab it before it goes. <laughs> Indeed, yes. Okay, well, thank you very much for asking me. Thank you. Thanks. Good night, Bye. everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye.